Okay, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that we can worship you, Lord. Thank you for everyone who believes in you, Lord, who has given their life to you. Lord, you you have a place, Lord, in your house that you've prepared for us. A place in heaven, Lord. Lord, we just thank you. You are our Father. You love us, Lord. You bless us. Lord, you've made provision for us. You've welcomed us because of Jesus. Father, we just praise you in this place, Lord. Lord, just thank you. Help us to follow you, Lord, because there is a a point of where we believe, there is a point of where we come to faith, Lord, where we become a Christian, but then after that, Lord, it's walking with you. Lord, and we just pray for the things as we look at your word now, Lord. Teach us what is right, what you say, Lord. There's lots of opinions in the world. Everybody can have opinions on things, all varied, they all differ. And Lord, and... The world very much likes that everybody can think what they want and any view goes and is okay. But Lord, that's not true with you. You have said certain things, Lord, are how it should be. You tell us that in the Bible, the things that we learn in the Bible, Lord. So we pray you would help us as Christians, Lord, to keep our lives lined up with what you say. In the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Every year, normally, as a church, the beginning of January, the first one, two, three, whatever services, we normally try and give a New Year's message and to sort of just give an idea of where the church is going or what we feel the Lord is saying to us at the beginning of the year. That's a little bit we're going to do today. Many, anybody who's been here for a while, and some of you have dibbed in and out, particularly the younger people, um, I've been looking at the book of Acts and going through a study on the book of Acts for the last, I don't know what, nine months or something now. Um, and we're still not finished yet, but we're not directly carrying on with that today in that order. But what we are going to do is just really a summary, a look at what we've learned from the book of Acts so far. And you could think, well, okay, that's, that's a nice thing to do. But actually, what I've found doing this, and I've read the Bible through, right through, two or three times, certainly when I was a younger Christian, but there's always stuff to keep learning. Don't matter if you've been a Christian for years, and years that are tens, plus tens, plus tens. There's always new things. There's things you thought you knew. There's things you've read lots of times, and suddenly what you thought, or you've read it past that, and you can't even remember that was in there, even though you've read it lots of times, because the Lord opens our eyes and shows us things. And what I think I kept saying with my mouth and understood is it's good to look at the book of Acts. The book of Acts is all about how the church started. Therefore, there's a lot we can learn about what the church should be like. But actually, that really is true. As as we've gone through it and we've picked things out, the book of Acts exactly tells us how a church should be set up and operate, a structure, a framework. And... We need to make sure this church fits sort of within that framework and some of those things. And God, we sing all about his blessing and everything and his love and a place for us, and he absolutely has. But part of it as well is walking with him then in this life once we become a Christian. And if we start to line up the church and we start to line up our lives, we will automatically just invoke God's blessing. God says, if you, God says many times in the Bible, and quite clear at times, if you do this, this, and this, I will bless you. Sometimes we don't like rules. We try to be careful in Christianity talking about you must do this as a Christian, you must do that, because you can end up with a load of rules to keep, and it's horrible, and it's far harder and worse than not being a Christian. But God does want us to live in certain ways. And God says, if you do these, I'll just bless you. It'll automatically happen. And we want to be blessed. We're singing all those songs. We want your presence. We want more of your presence in this place. When we sing and worship, we want to feel you here, Lord. Not goosey, bumpy feelings and some strange thing. We want to feel you, Lord, living God in this place. Amen. 
because really nothing else would do. Everything else is a fake. Everything else is a bit of a laugh, really, without God being real. So let me just read this little bit, which is just in my, it's in my notes to the Bible. It's not actual written scripture, but in the bit notes. The purpose of the book of Acts. The key to the purpose of Acts is in the first verse, where Luke, who wrote the book, implies the book is a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel told what Jesus both began to do and teach, and Acts tells us what the risen Lord continues to do and teach through the Holy Spirit in his church. So God gave us his Bible, all of it is relevant, the whole of the Old Testament is relevant. Then we get into the New Testament, there's four Gospels, one of them was by a man called Luke who wrote it, and that tells us all about the life of Jesus. It tells us how Jesus was born, what Jesus did in his life, how Jesus died, and that Jesus was resurrected. It tells us all the things that Jesus said and taught about how we should live and the fact we should believe in him. But then Jesus died. Yes, he came back to life. But then what God says, remember what we know about God, we know about the Trinity. God is God but he's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God the Son, in the form of Jesus, came into the world, introduced himself to us, died for us as our Saviour on the cross, and was resurrected. But then he said, in a sense, this is not enough. Jesus was one man, he was God, he was God-man, but he was one man. While he walked around, and we, quite a bit when we've done Acts, we've had maps up on the wall, Jesus was one man who walked from city to city to city. He couldn't be anywhere else. He could only be in the one place he was, where his legs were, and he was walking at the time. And he did miracles, and he preached the gospel about God the, God the Father. So God says, and Jesus says, when I resurrected and I ascend, and we read at the end of the book of Luke, the beginning of the book of Acts, about the ascension, Jesus goes back. He stands with the disciples, and then he goes back up into heaven. He's lifted from them there, and then up into heaven, and received back into heaven. And he says, when I do that, I'll go and ask my Father, God the Father, and he will send you the Holy Spirit. So now we've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, and he will now come to live in you. I will send you a helper, it says. A helper, the Holy Spirit, who will now come and live in you. So now there's not just one, in a sense, one Jesus person. There's now lots of Jesus people. Everybody who's a believer and believe and has the Holy Spirit come and live in them is now Jesus on the earth. And the Holy Spirit, he says, is to help us. He'll teach us all things. He'll remind us of everything we've been taught. He'll help explain to us scripture. He's the power and everything within us that helps us to walk this walk and this life with Jesus. And so Luke is all about Jesus, Jesus' life. And then Acts tells us about the start of the church. So now the Holy, at the very beginning of the book of Acts, exactly what Jesus has said, he says, go and wait in Jerusalem to the disciples. They didn't know what to do. Jesus has died. What do we do now? <laughs> We're at a loss. We're confused. We don't know what to do. He's not there to tell us anymore. Go and wait in Jerusalem and I'll send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down upon them, God himself in power, and came into them physically. And they began to speak with other tongues or the languages and saw tongues of fire in that fall upon them. Not, not tongues of fire that burnt them or consumed them or anything, but holy. God himself coming down upon them. And that's right the book of Acts. Then after that, what we've been reading for the last 20 odd chapters, we've got another, I think is it eight or, I can never remember, I keep saying this every week, I must check, 28 chapters, so we've got about another eight or so to do. It's all then about how the church grew and what God then did through all these people who believed in Jesus and were filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's the church. And ever since this, and you're talking back, you know, because of how we do our calendar based on Jesus' death, you're talking from Jesus in AD 0 or 
let, let's say that for the sake of not arguing all about whether it's exactly correct with the calendar, onwards, and we're now in what, 2019, we've just started. So Acts, and on after chapter 28, is all the things that God has done in his church, all the people who believed in Jesus filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's why we've been looking at Acts. We need to look at the Gospels, we need to look at what Jesus said in Jesus' words, because that's where they're written down. They're not Jesus' words, aren't repeated again later. You don't need to repeat them again later, you go and look in the four Gospels at what Jesus said. And all the things that Jesus said are extremely important, and they are how we learn about who God is and Jesus is and what they require of us. And really the whole book of Acts, I remember saying this when we were talking at the time, the book of Acts and the early church is birthed, brought about, created by the Holy Spirit. You get some churches, you get some Christians and they absolutely don't like all this Holy Spirit stuff. They don't agree with the Holy Spirit, they don't like the fact that it's, you can't define him as clearly as you can God the Father, God the Son, Jesus. God the Holy Spirit sounds a bit sort of like some vague wishy-washy flyy abouty thingy. He's a person. He's a person. He's a person that comes to live in you, that you can commune with God because he's in you. I stand sometimes, you sing and you worship and, and I'm still looking like that and we're singing and I'm, I'm maybe praying or something while we're worshipping. And I'm sort of praying to God because God's up there and I'm looking up at him because we're worshipping him. But that's not 100% correct. God is in us by his Holy Spirit. And God, the Holy Spirit in here and God in heaven, wherever heaven is, whether it is, we always think heaven's sort of up, <laughs> up in the sky, up through the clouds, up to the atmosphere and above and beyond that. Doesn't really say... <laughs> But God's in us, in a sense, when we're communing with God, we can sort of, it's between us and him, inside. But everything about the early church and the book of Acts, it's all to do with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's power. Without that, the church is nothing. The fact the church grew, loads of people come to believe in Jesus. Loads of miracles were done. They went and preached in different countries and started planting churches and the church grew and grew and grew it's all because of the power of the Holy Spirit doing the work through the people that went God is ordained God could quite easily turn up now show himself and his, I mean we'd all be dead if he did if he turned up now in his glory and holiness we'd all be flat on the floor and probably dead um, because he's so holy and perfect and beautiful beyond us but God could quite easily just give us all visions in our dreams and things, show him who he is, and we'd all believe. The whole world, quite easy. God could appear on the... You see things, you know, sci-fi things, Doctor Who things, where somebody takes over the world and appears on everybody's television screen and gives them a message they're going to take over the world or something. God could quite easily appear on every television screen, every mobile phone, and tell everybody he exists. And everybody will believe, and that's the end of time. But God has chosen not to do that. God has chosen to use people one by one, groups of people, churches by churches. It's how he said it's going to be. And I give them my power to be like Jesus. And then he carries on. This is why the church has been around for 2019 years and the world didn't end in AD 1. And we see continually, as you go through the book of Acts, references to the Holy Spirit. Continually the people were filled by the Holy Spirit, received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon them. There's about five different references, all use different words. Praise God, it's not an experience you can define or you can say that you must have it in that way and it always happens like this. And you can look at everybody and say, have you had this or haven't you, sort of thing. The words used to describe the people. We read through Paul and that came across groups of people. Said, have you received the Holy Spirit? Said, we don't even know what it is. We haven't even heard of it. And then they prayed for them. The Holy Spirit fell upon them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit filled them. It's different phrases and words and meanings as to how it happened for different groups of people.
So let's just read a couple of verses, Acts chapter 1. This is again right at the beginning before the Holy Spirit comes. Being as Acts chapter 1 verses 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 quickly. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which is you've heard from me, Jesus talking. For John truly baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons the Father's put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jesus said that he will be... John the Baptist came, he baptised with a baptism of repentance that people would turn from their wicked ways and back to God. But Jesus then said, more than that, you'll be baptised, filled with the Holy Spirit. And what's the whole reason? You receive power so that you can be my witnesses. There's nothing else in here. The Holy Spirit comes in order then that each of the people that believes in Jesus and then receives the Holy Spirit so that we've got a relationship with God is that we should be his witnesses. And further on then it talks about go and make... Dis- well, in fact, the end of Jesus' life similarly just before this, Matthew 28, the verses on your notice sheet, <laughs> Jesus said, go, preach the gospel, tell everybody um, and go and make disciples. So there's a double thing. There's a thing of being our witnesses and telling people about Jesus and people coming to believe and then there's making disciples which is then taking those people on in their walk with Jesus. And what we found again as we've gone through the book of Acts is the gospel is preached. The whole thing about Acts really is you see them going out and telling people of the whole story of Jesus. The whole account of what happened in Jerusalem when they were there at his death they saw him afterwards resurrected in his new living body and telling everybody about this and we find the gospels preached in all sorts of ways Paul and that we find often go and preach to lots of people Paul took every opportunity he could to preach to groups of people he used to go to the synagogue first the Jewish synagogue you're allowed to go in there and you're allowed to, there's a, a period where you, anybody new visiting it says you can stand up and like share something. Um, and Paul would go every time being a Jew first to the synagogue where the Jews were and tell them about Jesus. A lot of then, we thought the Jewish people weren't happy about that. They said you're distorting the Jewish faith, you're causing trouble. So Paul then went to the non-Jews, the Gentiles. And he'd go to where they all met in a building. Or they'd gather in a hall or something. He had meetings outside with groups of people. We talked about him down by, a couple of times, down by the riverside where people gathered. And he talked to them about Jesus. Personally, there's times where people only talk to one. Philip went to talk to the Ethiopian eunuch. It says the Holy Spirit just took him in the spirit and suddenly there he was on the road to Samaria. The Ethiopian eunuch in his caravan thing on his own, well, presumably with whoever was with him in the, in, in the caravan thing, but um, Philip went and just talked to that one person, the Ethiopian eunuch, led him to Christ and then disappeared and went somewhere else. You see, times in Acts, we've read two or three times, we've commented on this again, about families. Often when somebody was saved, take the jailer, the Ethiopian, I think it was Ethiopian, wasn't he, jailer. They were locked in the um, jail. God set them free, set all the shackles and the doors to come open, the shackles to fall off. But Paul and Silas still stayed there. They didn't leave and run out because they were free. They stayed there. The, the jailer comes in, um, thinks they've all run out and set, uh, you know, got free somehow. He's about to end his life because he knows the next day his bosses will end his life if he doesn't. 
because they've escaped. And they say, no, we're still here, don't kill yourself, we're still here. And he says, what have I got to do to be saved? And they tell him the gospel, and he says, he believes in his family and his household believes. There's a couple of other occasions like that, where they told somebody, like the father or something, and the whole family comes to believe. So individually to people preaching the gospel, to families, to groups, synagogues, in religious people, in other buildings, outside, every opportunity taken, they used to preach the gospel and to tell people about Jesus. And if they didn't, Acts would have got past the early chapters and we wouldn't have 28 chapters. And if they didn't carry on, we've done all the maps again. We started in Israel. The gospel's then gone upwards. Judea, Samaria, northern Israel and that. Then went out into Syria. Then went out all across Asia, Turkey and everything nowadays. We've gone into Greece and Europe. We know at the end of Acts, Paul goes to Rome. There the book of Acts finishes. But hang on, the gospel got to us. We're Britain. We're a long way from Italy and Greece, up the other north west end of Europe the gospel got to us the gospel got across them from us to America the whole of Africa so praise God way after Acts and you're only talking still at AD 100 or something way after that then the gospel has gone around the whole world not everybody believes there's still pockets and groups of people countries and ethnic groups within countries who haven't heard the gospel yet but the number's getting ever smaller all the time. This has carried on the witnessing around the world. The gospel is preached. There's a few times where there's big long sermons in the book of Acts. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost after receiving the Holy Spirit and preached a great long sermon. Paul occasionally starts and you get a whole chapter or something on what he said in his sermon as he stood up. All these sermons they preach are similar. You can almost get, and I, I didn't manage to get, there's like five points or something. They just simply talk about Jesus. They talk about these, the fact that he was expected, he was promised, he was the Messiah that the Jews were looking for. The fact that he is this person by what he did all the things recorded in the four Gospels. He came back to life, he did all this healing, he said he was the Son of God, etc. They, they pull scriptures out from the Old Testament, prophecies that point to who Jesus was and says, look, this has been fulfilled by Jesus. And they get to the end always, <laughs> the fifth point or whatever, at the end of the preaching, is what you must now do. Sometimes the Holy Spirit so came, he got to the end of his preaching, people were so convicted, rather than Paul now saying, right, it's having an appeal, put your hand up. They said, Tim, what must we do to be saved? The end of the one at Acts 2. Men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? We're so convicted by your preaching, the Holy Spirit, about Jesus. Praise God, this still happens. <laughs> we don't see it here. We haven't preached every week and people flocking in the door, etc. We know that. And we carry on the church with the same sort of similar group of people, a few new people and some leave, etc. And a lot of churches are like this. A lot of churches are like ours. But that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be like this, isn't like this in some places and can't be like this. What you find continuing in Acts and, and Acts is a bit of repetitive, and I've said this so many times, I'm repeating myself because it's repetitive. There's this cycle. You see them go and preach. You see people come to believe. There's signs and miracles following the preaching of the word. Many come and believe. And then persecution, we'll come to that in a minute. So another thing we find very much in Acts is that miracles followed the preaching of the word. Amen. Did with Jesus... Jesus, the whole of the Gospels with Jesus is a mix. There's a mix of the words that he said and the miracles that he did. I don't know if it's 50-50 or whatever, you went through and counted them all, and they're not all recorded by a long way. Miracles and signs and follow the preaching of the word. We don't have that <laughs> in a lot of churches. 
But if God really moves and wants to, the opportunity, we don't always do it here. Sometimes people like Jan, visiting speakers, do it rather than our own people here. You know, an opportunity to, to respond to God, for him to actually move and, and do something in our lives. It happens in big evangelistic crusades, <laughs> praise God, where they still pre you know, and I've said before about um, Christ for All Nations that we support, massive evangelistic crusades, pre absolute preaching of the straight gospel, need to repent and believe in Jesus. Amen. Miracles, signs, healings follow like anything in the meeting. Can happen in today, praise God. People like Jan do, Jan often asks sometimes he's and certainly some of the other meetings in churches he goes to, that there is more of a response of people. And so as the Gospels preach, the signs following, many people believe. And we read continually again. I, haven't, I mean, we'd be here forever if I tried to pull all the verses out where it keeps saying, every time this happened, many believed the Lord continually added to their number daily. And really, they were in revival. The church, the early church, the old book of Acts is in continuous revival. Many, many thousands. It records that day 5,000 people came to believe in the Lord, etc. 3,000 another day. This is what we believe in. But then also to follow. So many times we've read this great move of God immediately followed by trouble, hardship, and persecution. Everywhere they went, many believed, but it always says, and some didn't. Some did not believe the word they preached. Some would not listen or hear. And in some cases, it's not, it's not just that they listened and thought, oh, okay, I don't believe that, not to worry, I'll wander off and go into something else. You know, they were sort of neutral in the middle. There are a lot of people who were very, very angry with what was being preached. There were a lot of Jews that were angry because they felt their whole Jude um, Jewish faith was all being changed and taken over. And there's a lot of people, there were people, it said, who um, made images. So there's a lot of these cities of that, there were false gods they believed in, the goddess Diana and others, and they made carved images and they used to sell them. And they were greatly affected by the fact that Paul's preaching and people stopped buying these images they were making. Their livelihood was at threat. And lots of times we find there was key people stirred up. Often religious people. People sometimes who even said they believe. You can even find, even in the Christ forgets, you know, going out and opposing people who Muslims and Islam or something. Even in the Christian church. You can find people who oppose other parts of what the church believes. And what often happened then is groups of people, sometimes a few people, there's often a few people who were very angry then stirred up the rest. The rest weren't interested until somebody stirred them up. And then they all got angry and they got in a mob. And they went and grabbed often Peter, Paul, whoever was Silas, whoever was with them. And then officials, sometimes often officials, just like the, the people, the Romans, etc., who looked after things, just liked a nice, quiet life. You get somebody who's stirring things up and causing trouble, and you cause, then you're then causing them a load of grief and a load of work, and then they get involved, and they're not happy because you've disturbed their quiet life. So then all the officials got involved, and then they start arresting and start accusing, etc. We find in the book of Acts, Paul, so Paul again, I, I will get there at some stage, where Paul lists everything that happened to him. They were arrested umpteen times. They were beaten. They were put in prison at least two or three times, four times or so. They were accused of thing, crimes they hadn't done. They were silenced. They were told, you can go if you say no more about this Jesus. We'll let you go now. You've been in prison a day. You can go today, this morning. You mustn't preach any more about this Jesus. 
And sometimes they even back down and appease them. There's a couple of times we've read where they realise Paul is actually has Roman citizenship, which was very, very precious in those days and very powerful. And they suddenly realise actually they put somebody who's a Roman citizen in prison and then actually they were greatly afraid themselves, the officials. And then they appeased Paul of that. Please don't say anything. Please just go quietly. You know, don't tell him we put you in prison or anything else. Or we'll be in trouble. These things will come. The Bible clearly says for those who really believe in Jesus and follow him. And, and a lot of our brothers and sisters in other countries around the world see this. We don't in this country. A lot of Western countries where it's all dead easy and we're comfortable and we've got a happy life. Loads of possessiony things. We don't see this. But for a lot of Christians in other countries, they absolutely know what opposition and persecution is against them believing in Jesus. We'll get some of it. You tell some of your friends you believe in Jesus, you go to church, especially now more than even a few years ago, actually, even when we were young. You'll be opposed. Your friends will laugh at you. That's all right. Your friends will laugh at you, mock you. Why do you do that? You know, nobody else does that. Why do you believe that? You can believe what you want. Don't let people tell you what to do, etc. All these things. You will get some of that now as Christians in this country. Amen. If you went and tried doing something actually out on the streets, we see this even with the people that do things in Leicester that we know. Jan, when he goes to the clock tower, the, the, the people that just go and preach at the town hall, then you do start to get some opposition. People heckling you, shouting at you, throwing things at you. And you'll get backlash if there's other groups around, like Muslim groups, that you get trying to preach their thing as well. So we do see some of this, but not to the effect that we see elsewhere. Sometimes we find in these occasions as well, God miraculously intervenes. Sometimes he doesn't. We see a few occasions... Um, there's Paul and John in prison, uh, sorry, Peter and John in prison, and the angel comes and undoes the shackles and everything and lets them out. There's Peter in prison on his own, and all the other Christians are in an upper room praying for Peter being in prison. And an angel comes and lets him out, leaves the doors locked and everything, lets him out. And he goes and knocks on the... I mean, we're funny at the time. He goes and knocks on the door and the servant girl comes and opens the door and she's so shocked it's Peter. She, she shuts the door and leaves him standing there. <laughs> goes and tells the people, pray, and Peter's at the door. What a load of rubbish. How could that happen? We've been praying for it. <laughs> um, but the angel, God sends his angels to intervene. The Philippian jailer we talked about earlier, again, God sets them free, but they don't walk out and go and escape quickly God has another purpose the whole of the Philippian jailer his family his household all come to faith because God intervened there but other times they went in the jail they spent a night in there chained to soldiers locked up hardship they were beaten the next day they were let go and told to go and preach the gospel no more Praise God. There's absolute great things and absolutely when we're in those situations we can believe and see examples that God will intervene. Great examples of the church praying for each other in these situations. But also sometimes God doesn't. He just got to go through with it, come out the other end. There's an experience for a reason, something that you'll learn from going through that. It's 12 o'clock, I'm probably halfway through. So I'm pinching next week to do part two. Oh, there's a... Right, right. Hands up, next week I'll stay another hour. Right. If you were a real church, having read all this, you'd happily stay for another few... Anyway. So, I've heard it said elsewhere, but... <laughs> Which is a bit, it's a good point actually ending there. And as we go on then, the other half I've got is getting a little bit more into sort of actual church. This is very high level. This is the whole Christianity I've gone through there. How the church came about, sort of what happens generally, what our whole reason calling that is. Then we need to apply it a little bit more to church.
specifically and what does it mean and what do we learn? As So at the beginning of Acts, all these people believe, etc. And they're all, they're all around. As Paul then gets involved, which is not till sort of Acts chapter 9 odd, and starts to go on his missionary journeys, which we've gone in a lot of detail on with the maps and things, Paul starts to put some structure into this religion, into this belief, and starts to set up churches and establish and what that means and how they should operate. Um, so we'll go on to that in a bit more detail next week. Let's pray.